Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped. And as I say at the beginning of all of these, I am very excited by today's guest. I have made the sum total of no notes on this man because I feel like I know him so well. He is a hero of mine. There is a moment that this man created. And if you've seen the movie Train Spotting and the scene where Archie Gemmell scores a goal for Scotland in the 1978 World Cup, that is what this man did in rugby for a generation and possibly more than a generation of Scottish rugby supporters. He is now borrowed by business and sport and parents and all sorts to try and make life better. And I am very excited to have him as a guest on the podcast. So let's get going with the one and the only Mr. Tony Stanger. Hey, Bruce, how are you? Yeah, very well. I'm absolutely delighted to have you as a guest. When I, when we started talking about a podcast, I made my list of people that I wanted to be on the pod and you are on the original list. So I'm oh, delighted awesome. that you're Good. able to be here. Nice to hear it. <laughs> now, well, let's start from that point because you're probably sick of talking about it and we'll, we'll get out of the way early. In 1990, you scored a try that I don't know if you've been able to dine out on for all that time, but people like me talk to you about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose it was a long time ago, as you, as you know, we, but a lot's happened between now and then. Um, but I tell you what, what, what I do, what, what's what I like. Um, you know, rugby. Rugby was something I, I did. I felt it's not who I am. It's just something that I did, and I, and I loved it. But what, what I love about that particularly was I have um, there's people I've never met before who I have a shared emotional memory with because of that game. There, people love to come up to me and say, I was there, can I just shake your hand? What a great day. Or I was down south with a group of uni pals and I was the only Scotsman in the room and it was a, an amazing day. And, and people liked it. They remember it like it was yesterday, as, as I do, because of the emotion of the situation. So to have, you know, sport can do that. I think other things, art can do that. Music can do that as well. But just to have that sort of shared emotional connection with someone you've never met is uh, is amazing, really, and and I, and I love that about it as much as um, you know, people might say, well, you never kind of talk about it too much, and yeah, it was great, it was a nice memory. It's time to move on. I'm kind of more forward looking than backward looking, but but I don't underestimate how powerful it can be. The human connection is what we're all about. I think we've missed that over the last twelve months. So to to be able to have someone you've never met before come up to you and just remember a specific moment in time where you were both doing slightly different things but involved in the same moment is a uh, is amazing so i don't take that lightly and it was a uh, nice to really nice to be a part of that it's it's really powerful how much of this and we'll get into learning and we'll get into acquiring skill and and all those good bits that you've got so much knowledge in how much of that situation can you attribute to luck um, the, an, an interesting question because you know obviously the 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 bounce of the ball and a number of things could have could have gone a different way. Um, and you, I've told you the story before. I almost didn't play in the game. I hurt my uh, my uh, collarbone the weekend before playing for Hoyk in a in a league game against Stumel. So it was touch and go whether I would play again. I think if that had been in the modern, actually play the game. So if that, that had been just now, I think the medics would have at least, there's no way he's going to be able to play. So, you know, again, lucky that lucky that I, I played in that particular era where, you know, it was kind of some of the decision was left, left up to me and not some, somebody else. So, yes, there's a bit of the bounce of the, the ball. Um, there's also, you could say, well, it wasn't the easiest catch in the world to take as well. I didn't exactly jump up into my basket. So, um, <laughs> so um, yes, no, it, it does. I think the circumstances, if you, the, the preparation, I think people always say that, and I do believe it. You know, you, you prepare and, and you just have to respond to what happens in front of you. And, um, you know, to keep uh, keeping things current, well, I think if we look back and see how we've responded as human beings over the last 12 months to what's happened, I think we've done an amazing job. I, I, I don't think we give enough credit to the scientists to be able to come up with a vaccine in such a short period of time. So we're very adaptable as, as human beings and, and as a species. So, uh, so yes, you know, that these things happen to you and respond to them. So I think I'd like to say if I was bigging myself up that I'd, um, I'd prepared for these different eventualities and, and um, you know, that's what the training and the preparation does, you know, who knows what can happen, but let's try and be as ready for it as we can. And that that moment, I don't think will be, it's a highlight of your life, but you've already said you're a forward-looking person, so there's still a lot of highlights to come. 
I'm a great believer in we're products of our environment and our upbringing. What what can you see for the future for Tony Stanger? Knowing everything you know already, what can you see the future holds for you? Yeah, another another great question. So so um, I suppose it's um, so I born and brought up in Hoyk. It was a, a rugby town. You know, it's like rugby as you well know, very culturally significant in, in Hoyk. So therefore, as a quiet, shy young man, you know, growing up in a small town, you know, it was a way to get a bit of credibility with, you know, the people around about you. So, and it kind of suited me physically. And I was, um, I was quite big when I was young. I was, I was fast. And um, so therefore, you know, that kind of played into my hands in terms of, of, of rugby. But I, I think the thing about me was but because I was quiet and shy, I was a real thinker. So I put an awful lot of thought into to what I was doing. And I don't think I really, um, I've become, I've come to realize this rather than knew it at that point, that it was just, in rugby was something I was interested in, but it wasn't that wasn't who I was. It was just something I did. So I was able, I think, quite easily to make a transition, for example, from rugby when I retired into coaching and then from, from coaching and rugby full time to working at the Institute of Sport in Stirling and, and doing different things. So but it's all when I look back, it's all based on something that challenges me and stretches me as a person, understanding that an awful lot of what I achieve is within my control and then giving giving myself to whatever that is a hundred percent and then ultimately you can't be too disappointed if you've given it your, your best shot if it doesn't quite work out then then so be it but um so lots of learning along the way so as much as rugby was a, an amazing part of of my life and i met some amazing people and built some great relationships you know that was the opportunity in the environment round about you to, to 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 challenge you and sport does that you know you go in the work i do now with businesses sometimes in a business world people go in they look at their diary for the week. They know how to do everything in that diary. They do it. And then, well, back in the olden days, they went home at the weekend. Now they stay at home at the weekend. So whereas in sport, what you do is you look at your week and say, well, okay, what's going on this week? Could I be a bit faster, a bit stronger? What's the opposition this weekend? What can we do technically or tactically to overcome this opposition? Then you focus on that. So I think the sport has helped me to look at life in that way that, you know, there's just a, an opportunity to, to learn and grow and move forward here and then just focus that that ability, that 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 way of thinking on whatever I choose to do next, whether that's bringing up your own kids, whether that's changing direction in terms of what you do as a career, whether it's I love golf. I'm just looking out the window here as it's kind of sleeting in Dunblane. I'm due to play golf this afternoon, so I'm getting a bit twitchy because I love that because I love it's good fun and you play with pals, but you also you want to try and be as good as you can. So I can apply everything I've learned to that situation as well. So it's um it, it's really is is probably I didn't realise it. And couldn't articulate it clearly when I was growing up, but I've always enjoyed this process of just kind of testing myself a little bit. So I wonder if I can do that. And and if I give it a good go and I can't don't quite get there, you know, no harm done. Just let's move on and do something else. Are you still ridiculously competitive? Like when you go and play golf this afternoon, I know you're playing with your pals and there's maybe no trophy at the end of it, but do you still want to win? Um I'm com very competitive with myself. I'm not not so with other people. So you wouldn't know if I was playing having a game of ping pong with you. You wouldn't see me ranting and raving if uh, if you nosed ahead in the game. I, I would, but I'd be disappointed in myself if I missed an easy shot or if I'd, I'd um, you know if there's something that was in my control that that uh, I'd let myself down. So um, so yeah, and, and I'm able to then. So yeah, enjoy it, enjoy the spirit of competition. But it's about me. It's about you know knowing what you're capable of, and and then you you know you're delighted when things go well and you play well well and you're on a good score and you've got three holes to go and you manage to kind of par your way in that's a, that's a great feeling and who cares you're you know whether you've won the competition or not and beating somebody else who might be having a great day but you've been able to handle that situation because you've done some of the things you've done to prepare and um, and again it's a sport is, is a good way of doing that why, why wasn't I able to handle those last three holes and, and put in a good score well because I haven't really practiced that in my swing do you know what it's a little bit you know, it, it's a kind of swing that doesn't really hold up under pressure. So if I wanted to do something about it, I'd have to kind of simplify my swing. So I'm prepared to do that. Yes, I know make that decision. And then you say, right, okay, this is so I, I can't beat myself up if I if I don't do it in the future if I'm not working on it. So um so it's but again with something like golf, which is a hobby of mine, then I don't I you know, I don't for example, I don't put the level of scrutiny on that as I would do in my rugby career or my business career at the moment. You know, it, it's kind of in there and I'm doing it, but so therefore I'm not too disappointed if progress is not super, super fast. And that's a, obviously it's a mature view and you've had a lot of learning along the way. How early in your career 
was it about you rather than about winning or being selected or how you were perceived by others? I, I think it probably unfortunately that um, in society still do this. We love a label, don't we? Uh, I know you work in teaching. That it's so easy to say kids who are the smart kids and who are the kids who are struggling and the kids who are you know disruptive or all these things. We unfortunately in life we love a label. So I, I know I've accepted labels along the way, even part of my rugby career, you know, things I could, could, could and couldn't do. Oh, you're good at this, but don't you be kicking the ball, son, because you're no good at that. Somebody else, leave that to somebody else. You know, these are, these are very powerful statements which are given to young people, which kind of shape their beliefs about things. And we have to be very careful with that, ridiculously careful with that. And I, and I see elements of poor coaching all the time that we, we limit other people's potential by throwaway comments sometimes. So, and I think I, I definitely fell into that, that category. And and you'll remember as well as I do. There was there was definitely a, a kind of safety first culture in rugby. It was we we always used to finish a rugby training session with two lengths of unopposed, no dropping the ball. And if you don't drop the ball over two lengths of unopposed, you get to go in and get a shower. So what's the easiest way not to drop the ball is to stand a bit closer together rather than move the ball quickly, move it slowly. And of course you that you achieve the objective, which is to get up and down without dropping the ball. But you've learned. You, you've reinforced a skill set of, which is not going to help you in the actual performance. So we have to be very careful about errors and mistakes and say, listen, they are part of the learning process. We shouldn't we shouldn't just say errors are fine. We should say errors are, are something that we learn from and we don't set up learning environments that actually compromise people's learning rather than than, than allow it to grow and expand. So I, I went through an awful lot and, and I don't want to be too critical, but I went through an awful lot of environments which I thought this is not as good as it could be in terms of what, why are we, for example, you know, focusing on this through the week, we get seem to get better at training and we have great training sessions and we still have an issue with this at the game at the weekend. You know, why are we jumping around from then doing this and then suddenly there's a problem with that, right, we're do, doing this now. And, you know, why was... I guess I, you know, criticised in a lot of ways for, for not being fit enough where rugby was about, you know, to me it was about speed and, and uh, agility and power rather than doing 10 laps to warm up. So I suppose I came through an environment which didn't make sense to me as a, as a thinker. And it's why ultimately I left a couple of jobs, went back to university when I was 25. And I'm happy to share the story. So I, I left school with two C grade hires. And I, and I failed all my O grades, as people will, who are old as me know an O grade was like a na National 5 now. So I did physics and chemistry and biology at National 5, failed them all. And then I wanted to do an applied sports science degree when I was 26. And you needed, I think, based on your higher results, you needed 18 points to get onto the, the course. I had six points based on two C grade uh, hires, uh, one in English, one in accountancy, I think it, I think it was. Um, there were 30 kids in my class, so all of them had something like the points in the 20s. But after four years um, of, of commitment from myself, there's only one person in the class who got a first-class honours degree in applied sports science. So it really taught me a massive lesson that I'd allowed maybe schooling to pigeonhole me as, yeah, you know, not particularly bright and, and um, but good at and maybe some other things to saying, listen, this is actually up to me. You know, I get to decide here. I'm not going to let somebody else tell me what I can and can't do. I'll decide to go for it. And uh, and if I'm committed enough and this is the outcome is important enough to me, it's amazing what can be achieved. So I think that period of my life from mid-20s to, to early 30s when I was still playing international rugby at that point, was massively shaping in terms of my beliefs around what ability is and where it comes from. And I was also able to study that as well. So this whole notion of you're a natural, you're, you're gifted is, is, um, is ultimately nonsense, you know. So, so let's get that message out there and, and move away from that and uh, get more young people understanding. It's not, it's not our job as adults to limit young people's potential. But unfortunately, I see that happening uh, too often at the moment. Yeah, there's so many bits in there. Um one of them, and I've spoken to a couple of guests on about this. I was at my kids' Christmas carol concert three or four years ago, and all the P1 classes all sang their hearts out, and all the proud parents were there. And as I was leaving, the deputy head teacher was holding the door open. And as I walked past her, I said, it's a real shame what happens to kids, because every single one of them, if you asked them if they could sing, they would say yes. But there then comes a point where language and, and adults project things onto kids like, I'm not a singer, I'm not a sporty person, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a... And just by accepting that and verbalising that and saying it's okay for that, 
a lot of kids then have that feeling that you're saying just now and they're they're given a label and and it breaks my heart i can't remember i think it's attributed to picasso that every child's an art or da vinci every child's an artist until an adult tells them they're not where do you think the biggest progress could be made in that area you know, I, I work a lot in coaching. If, if, I, if, I, if I was in charge of budgets, I'd pay the, the, the biggest salaries to coaches who work at that age from participation. That, that, that crossroads between participation when you step into maybe thinking, you know, I'm, I'm really quite enjoying this. I'd like to progress and do this a little bit more here. I think that's where we, we need to have our very best coaches. Now, it's a different skill set. So I wouldn't say Gregor Townsend necessarily yeah. would have the skill set to drop down and do that. But it's a very particular skill set. Um, my wife, who you don't don't know, did did that. She doesn't do it now, but at primary school, she gave up her own time to work for an athletics uh, to do some work with athletics at a local primary school, and very inclusive. You know, there was no who's the fastest, who's the slow. Everybody progressed at your own rates, and and she has, a, you know, I'm, I'm I'm bigging her up here, but she's really got that skill set to do that really well to encourage people to get. And this is remember, this is in Scotland. This is an after school cross country athletics club. You know, how many people are you going to get? Literally over, couldn't, you know, particularly as regulations change with numbers, et cetera, you know, couldn't cope with the number of kids who wanted to do it. Now, was there an element of an extra an, an extra hour at school as babysitting? Potentially, but these kids loved it and they went to competitions and did runs regardless of their ability. So the, the ability to hold people in sport and do it a bit longer and, and avoid these labels is, is, a, is not easy to do. But if you focus on that as a number one skill, so how many sets and reps and all these kind of things that you do is much less important than the, your ability to inspire someone to keep going and not look at what other kids are doing and say, well, they're faster than me. Well, actually, just progress at your rate. Are you getting better? Can you see the signs of improvement? Fantastic. So I think we don't, we, we, we do, don't get me wrong, governing bodies do look at that, but I don't think we really focus heavily enough on that and say how important this is to the bigger picture. Because if we're always looking back to saying in a small country like Scotland, well, how many people have we got to pick from in this particular sport? Well, where's, where's the big dropout happening? It's happening down there where kids are, for whatever reason, getting the message sometimes, well, you know, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. And you can you ask it, what, why? I said to my, my youngest, this is a few years ago, I'm rubbish at spelling, Dad. I said, you know, because I'm on that, like, you why, why do you think that? Um, well, teachers put everybody into... To, um, different groups in the spelling groups in the class and I'm in the bottom one. I said, did the teacher say you're in the bottom one? No, but, you know, the best spellers are in this group and all the ones, you know, and, and the worst spellers are in my group. So you don't even have to say something sometimes, you know, but, but kids pick these things up. So very important that we try and get this message across there. It's an ongoing journey. It's non, non-linear. Let's let's al- allow us to take the, the steps to get there and show people the signs of improvement. And that's where the motivation can really kick in and, and people can then you know progress on and, and stay in things longer when, and not decide when it's right for them to stop, not do it based on what an adult, as you say, has, has maybe I've told them. Yeah, uh, again, love it. And you, you mentioned inspiration there. And I think, and I don't know your wife, you're right, although we have she does reply to me when you forget sometimes. So I'm, be, I'm beginning to get the relationship here. But I would imagine a big part of why she was successful in having numbers and kids who were motivated was because of the relationship that she'd built with them. And this is something that now we keep coming back to. You've already said it's more important than the reps and the sets. When I've spoken to other people on this podcast, they've said, you know, we make things complicated, especially the game of rugby, but it comes down to some pretty basic things and the relationships that you have. Now, you've had some pretty inspirational people involved in your life, and I can remember you coming back to uni as a student and admiring you from afar, working with Malcolm Fairweather on not just the physical attributes that you needed, but I would imagine a huge number of mental, emotional, social aspects, knowing Malcolm Fairweather as I do. You, I would imagine you take something from everyone and then you make it into Tony Stanger. Who, who have you taken lots from? What sort of people do you take from and learn and mould it into your own? Yeah, it, I know it's, it's a great question. It would be uh, probably remiss if, if you if you think about the the, the journey. And I've, I've got four brothers, and um, we all got on ridiculously well together. And we're all within an eight year age gap, and we 
we had lots of, you know, just to have that those raw materials, particularly physically, um, to, to be able to kind of go and do stuff back in the day when there was less other things to do. We had a big garden, so you go out and, and just do things. You know, parents were, were, were very shaping rugby-wise. May Sinclair, when I was at school, at primary school, was a very unusual as a, a female um, teacher who took, took rugby give up her time and commitment, taught you the basic skills. Bill McLaren, as you know, was was a PE teacher of mine, you know, who, who took all the primary schools in Hoyt. So the, there's countless numbers of, of, of people who, and a lot of it was about commitment and support and helping you. And, and although I didn't, the, the the labels I can't I couldn't say who you know where it came from it was more more general just I think in society accepting that you either got this ability or you haven't and fortunately people maybe said that I did so I, so I maybe started to believe that oh you're good you're fast you're this the other so I know loads of kids maybe had a different experience and, and dropped out and probably hate sport because of that Matt Malcolm's a really important um, person in my development because he opened my eyes to an alternate view of of of, of development so. This idea of you know ten laps of the pitch to warm up and we, we everything's kind of structured in a certain way and there's a thing called blocked and random practice and skill acquisition we just practice the same skills over and over again we get good at practicing but those don't transfer well into a game so there's all these things which have been going on for years and years which had never seemed to come into and I felt I was playing you know for Hoyk was one of the if not the best one of the best clubs in Scotland and then you're into South and then Scotland and there's all this information out there that's never been you know we don't seem to be using and we're certainly we're certainly not using the the in the way it was intended to do so so that going to uni was a massively important part of my life to open my eyes to to what's possible and now that was sort of the mid 90s and looking at how professional teams prepare now this is exactly the stuff that they're they're using and the the quality of the coaching is chalk and cheese from people like jim um jim telfer and mcgeek and those kind of guys brilliant coaches you know and particularly Geach was someone who really why why always kick it over to the left hand side just over the 10 meter line and get them to catch it then hoover to touch why not kick it over there so they were pushing the boundaries but so when the sports science really got a hold of it then then we really started to change things so Markham was amazing just opened my eyes to what is it what is even skill acquisition she, you just got into that habit of going doing a drill and I, and I don't like the idea of a drill because it's you, you drill a certain movement into you which you then if it's not relevant to a game you remember I don't know whether they still do it or not but you used to set up um, four on a corner then you'd run across and pop the ball at the person coming to you I think you always you think that through how often do we just run across and pop a ball to someone so are we setting these these squares up just because they're they're easy or, or are we setting them up because they actually make a difference so there's all these things were challenged and I think you know nowadays what it, what it looks like um, is so much closer to what really what it could be in terms of genuinely developing skills. And I think we're seeing we're seeing a physically dominant rugby. We're seeing enough of the signs of highly skilled players now being able to make good decisions very quickly that show that some of that stuff is now really starting to to work and we're getting a, a, a better and better product in terms of what rugby looks like um, for the viewing public. And rugby has played a massive part in your life, but other sports you've been involved with and I know you're a football coach and there's you I just feel that you you pick things and you learn from them and it and it helps you with your focus and where you're going what other sports do you look at and think they've got it right or I would love a shot of that or why are they not doing what they're doing what what sports really interest you and get your back up a bit and I, I do, you're, you're, you're dead right. I, I like to look and, and listen. I, I suppose I come back to kind of principles so that people do. So there's no, there's no from certainly what I've looked at, there's no one personality that works well as, as a coach. It can be any, you know, you don't, the, the shouter and baller, you know, you, you can, you can put someone who's more passionate. People can get a lot from that because you, the passion just comes off the, the quieter, more reflective, you know, you can get maybe some of the more, the, the, the detail. Having a range of styles is quite useful. I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at American football because I'm fascinated there of, of um, a lot of sports as a coach. You, you Once they go on to the, the pitch or the court, then then that's it. You know, you, you're, you're relying on the job that you have done is, is allowing them to make good decisions and do the right things under pressure. And sometimes you have a chance to talk to them. And between that, sometimes you don't. American football is fascinating because it's, it's a lot of it is very scripted. So you as an individual, Bruce, here's your route here. So you've got to run seven yards forward then eight yards to the left and turn and the ball will be there. 
and then it's fascinating what they have to learn. But then if that doesn't happen, then the second thing that might happen is if, if, if they've defended it differently, is then you might have to run here next. And then, so a lot of it is pre-programmed and you have to go through. It. So it fascinates me that these big coaches in America get a lot of credibility for this, where, where play, for picking what to do in certain situations. So they spend hours on video looking at what teams are going to do. But then the quarterback is the thing that fascinates me the most because the amount of information they have to process in a game is unbelievable. So they they make it, they play, they call the play, they go down, they then look at um, what the opposition defence are going to do. Then they might change the call at that point. Then each of the different receivers or, or the, what the play is going to be, they might have two or three options for each of those receivers. So imagine having to try and process all that information in one go. So it's fascinating how those individuals, someone like Tom Brady, can do that for so long over such a long period of time. So there's lots of really good shows on TV that look behind the scenes of American football, School of Hard Knocks, etc. So they're, they're really interesting. From If you're into coaching, they're fascinating to watch, to see an approach to coaching that um, that really is, is kind of very prescriptive in some regards, but in, incredibly complex in, in others to allow someone to process information in a short period of, of time. And um, again, so I'm, I'm, I know I'm conscious I'm rattling on here, but the football coaching, I've, I've loved doing that because, uh, um, you know, we chatted recently, you know, one of the biggest coaching challenges that I've ever had was, was 20, you know, 13 and 14 year old boys on my own with a bag of footballs and half a dozen cones on a quarter of a football pitch on a wet, windy night in Sterling. You know, you go, how are you going to allow those those 20 individuals to, to get something out of that that makes them want to come back and, and feel like they've had a, a progression from that one-hour session? So uh, um, that's been great to be able to do that, that that um, that sort of age group. And I've, yeah, I've, I've certainly tested myself. Would I say it is exactly my sweet spot in terms of you know that's the I I have the I could whilst I could have the skills at that level you know it's it's a it's a big challenge and, and um, lots of parents are putting their hands up to do it which is great but it's it's very difficult so we're we're asking volunteers to take that on and it really in, in many ways is the hardest coaching challenge we'll, we'll face in sport especially when one of them is your own <laughs> exactly yes. <laughs> Who does it? Who, who, Thirteen or fourteen year old as a boy, all he's worried about is that you say something daft in front of his pals that is going to make him uh, ridiculously embarrassed. So um, yes, that's it's an interesting dynamic. So again, again, for the next one hour, son, I'm your uh, I'm your coach. I'm not your dad. Okay, so but that's uh, easy to say, not so easy to do. Now you mentioned your brothers, and I know I've. I've taught some of your nephews and, and nieces and thing and one of those annoyingly uh, able families who put a lot of time and effort into sport I remember your niece just blew me away being good at bloody everything uh, and, and a determination that I think comes from that environment. Now you mentioned about coaching for an hour and I was asked to go on a, a coaching podcast a couple of years ago and it was run by a football guy and he was talking about it at Manchester United. They have the cage where they just put people in and they just play and learning happens in the cage and, and this kind of thing. Now, when I was a kid in Stow, we had the tar, which was pretty much a cage. <laughs> and we played with a, a rubbish wee ball and you learned to push him and kick him and elbow him, but you knew you were going to get kicked off of him and, and we learned a lot in that environment, totally unstructured, but it was play and we were passionate and we fell out with him because he cheated or her because she was offside or because it, it really mattered. But you learned a lot. I would imagine you and your brothers in the back garden had games that wouldn't make sense to me because they were the stranger rules. And you would have come to the tar and watched me and my big brother Craig playing one each end and going, what? the hell is this but we played for hours and hours and hours now lots of parents um take their kids to stuff that start at seven and finishes at eight and the kids are going to be coached where does the play fit now do you think yeah, this this is crucial the I, I guess a key a key message i think is is 
for anyone, I suppose, if I was summarising a lot of the stuff that I feel are important from what I've learned so far, is that is not to take that learning responsibility away from the individual. We do that too often by jumping in too quickly to tell someone or saying, "Here's what you need to do," or, or "Don't worry, I'll get this for you," kind of thing. So don't don't take that learning responsibility away. It takes a bit longer sometimes because you've got to allow people to go through things and think about it and what would you do here. And I think that's exactly what's happening when you talk about unstructured play just out there. You have to find a solution. So this this big kid here is, is running rings around us. How, how are we going to manage to get around it? You know, this is this is good fun, so we'll find a way in that exploration and stuff, whereas sometimes it can be tempting to come in, so here's how we have to hold it. Here's 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 what you need to do and, and that kind of overcoaching, if you like. So there's a massive place for, uh, for that. I think it's a shame for young people the last 12 months, you know, they've not been able to get out and do that kind of stuff. Um, and 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 play. My my oldest son is involved in professional football, but he even when he was was full time, he still would take some time to go and kick a ball out with his pals because that's where he where he got to where he did was just doing that messing about, doing fancy kicks and all that kind of stuff. And that's the fun part of it, was, was the learning part of it as well. So we need to fit it in both of those things in, and we need to m make sure if we're going to take people in for an hour's coaching from seven to eight, what what are the things that we're actually focusing on there? Is it all about technique and structure, and or is it some of the fun stuff we want to do as, as, as well? Is it about some of the psychological stuff? Is it the behavioural stuff you want to develop? Listen, everything about tonight is going to be, listen, let's, let's challenge ourselves and see what we can do. And if it doesn't quite come off, let's take some time to talk about it and what we do differently next time. So the content of that is really crucial. So still have some of that, have a combination of the both. But if there is something that we might miss from unstructured play, what, what is that? Let's understand that. And then let's make sure we add that into something which is a little bit more structured, but still delivered in a way which gives a responsibility of learning to the individual and is fun and enjoyable to do. So you get them keeping coming back as well. My, my wife gives me a hard time when I start talking about growing up in the wee village of Stow because she says you weren't Ur Wally. Like you, you make out <laughs> that this is Ur Wally, but in Stow, if you wanted a game of football, Danny Riddle was playing, having finished a day worth of fencing, and he was in his 50s. And, and I was playing as a, a, nine, a 10 year old, and my big brother was playing, who's six years my senior. But conditioned games I'd never heard of until I went to be a PE teacher. Yeah. We'd be doing condition games in Stow Park for years and years because exactly. he was only allowed three touches because otherwise nobody would get the ball and you had to pass there and you could only be two goals in front and all that, Krista. Where where do you see that coming? Because if somebody was to bring their kid to you for a football session and you ended up just giving them unstructured play, they'd probably be saying, hang on a minute. But... Are we trying to recreate something that we hoped would happen outside of that structure? Yeah, this is why I think it's, a, it's definitely a combination of the of the two because um, you know the reason you'd you'd break a game down into smaller skills is to give people time on task so to practice a certain skill. So if you're if you're not getting enough touches with your left foot in a in a in, a, in an unstructured game then then when are you going to work on that? When are you going to do that? And that's what I think happened with, with really switched on kids or, or just because you adapted it, didn't you? You said, right, you're only allowed to play with your left foot now. Um, now that happened just kind of randomly and sometimes the environment would allow you to do that and sometimes it wouldn't. So it's bringing those elements in there. We still got to have a picture of what, what what's going to keep the kids in the sport for a longer period of time? What are some of these things? What, what do they enjoy about it? And then, then can we add these things in um, to, to, to kind of, so it's still a kind of more structured session, but it can feel a bit more unstructured. And and, um, and again, particularly given responsibility to, to the learner. So so there's, there's this, it's all those good things that, you know, we, we came across and, and, and let's not just say, well, let's go back and do that just because that was good. Let's take some of the best of that, take some of the best of the other environment and throw it together. And, and that takes, as we said before, it takes, a high skill from a coach to be able to do that it takes a lot of understanding of all the building blocks of, of someone's long-term potential and then you've got to sell that to people to buy in because if you're asking parents when there's loads of other things they could do what is the benefit and, and I don't think we sell that we sometimes say sport's good everyone should do sport it's a good thing to do well why why, why is that some people have a horrible experience because they come in and they're, they feel they're rubbish and they're no, they're no good and, and uh, they, want, they want to pack it in because they're not getting instant success and, and uh, they want to post a picture online of, of them winning a medal or something like that so so we've got to understand all those influences there so that's why I say it's really a difficult thing to do and there's a lot of competition now um, I'm a lot older than you but there was no 
there was there was there's so many more. There's, there's never been a, a better time in life if you want to sit and do nothing at home and still be entertained. You know, I, I was you know you couldn't sit and you know you went into reading when you were a kid and there was only three TV channels and we didn't get a video recorder till we were um, I was at the middle middle of my teens. I still remember now the remote control was on a on a wire thing which had to plug into the side of the video. So the, these we, nowadays you can stay home as as we've seen and people can I can get there's loads of stuff to do. You know, so we have to understand that is there. So we've got to, if we're going to put a product out there which we want to draw young people away from that, which is, and there's lots of educational stuff as well. There's some brilliant documentaries that, and there's loads of good things to to watch on a screen. So if we want to draw people away from that. We've got to make sure the product is uh, is actually one not only helps them in that one hour or whatever they're doing, but also you're developing some skills they can take into the rest of their life. So it's, um, the world is moving on. It's great. There's, there's some great things in there. But for sport, it kind of makes our life a little bit more challenging because we can't just provide same old, same old for young people and expect them to keep flocking back and, and turning up. So, again, investing resources in, in, a, in a real key area. And I always like this idea of this question, uh, are people successful because of the help and support you provide them or despite it? They just find a way to work around poor coaching or poor teaching or poor poor manager, whenever it might be in a business setting. Yeah, I hear that a lot of teachers who told kids they were never going to be and then the kid becomes a, a yeah. and, and unfortunately it still seems to be happening. Um, mm. Music is an interesting one for me because I've not got, I can't read music um, and I don't play an instrument. And there is a story that I tell when I, I get onto growth mindset about trying to learn the guitar. But I quite often talk to kids in sport about music where you go for your lesson for an hour. But if you only did the lesson for an hour, your rate of progress is going to be really slow. You go for an hour to get that input and then it's up to you to go away and put in the 12 hours of practice to to make any improvement. That can only come with passion, inspiration being ignited, but building habits how do you go about encouraging people to build those good habits yeah a really um a really good and difficult question there's a there's definitely a number of people that i've spoken to high performing in sport who they needed a bit of a nudge to get over that hurdle to keep going back for whatever reason so we i think the idea of saying particularly young people well you just choose what you want to do um is, is a is a tricky one because sometimes people can you've got to persevere maybe long enough music's a great example does someone really like to do you know hours and hours of of, of practice um why is that is it because your pay, your mum and dad want you to do it what, what's really driving that that but then ultimately to me what you'd look at that what, what you're learning from that you're learning commitment you know, and dedication to a particular thing. You're, you're learning some fine motor skills. You're learning how to communicate with someone else who might be a teacher who might be older than you, for example. So in terms of what you genuinely learn from that is not necessarily how to be, you know, the, the outcome that you hear when someone plays the music, but you learn all those particular skills as you go. And uh, and, and I think those are the things that, that, which are really important to sell because ultimately you and I know as, as you're older and young kids don't know this yet, you, you need these things in whatever you do in life, whether it's just in your own personal relationship, you've, you know, you've got to commit to that, whether it's a job, whether it's all, all these different things. So these are these are just particular skills which are then focused on a particular area you're interested in. And there's no point in hammering someone if they really, really don't like it, but it's always a great question to ask. We've asked our kids whenever it came to a, a, a situation where they were doing something and they decided they didn't want to do it again, we'd always have that discussion, an open and honest discussion. Okay, that's fine. So we're keen to understand a bit about why, you know, what you're thinking here. Sometimes it was because I want to do something else because my pals are doing it. And, and sometimes there's a particular element of it that they didn't in, enjoy. But then when we talked it through, they decided to persevere and, 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 and did actually get more out of it. You know, um, there's a whole host of reasons. So we've, um, I, I think that's a, a, an, an important part of it as, as well, is that the, the, the habit building takes a bit of time. And it's, it's kind of, um, and have have good people around the bike to ask you the question to nudge you in the right come on you'll be fine you find you go for 10 minutes see what it's like i've, I've heard, my, heard myself do that with my kids loads you know that okay should i be doing this should i be saying listen you've got to go you're come on let's go and do it 
Um, but then having good people around about you who you know are going to nudge you, but then having the, the time to have relaxed discussions at the right time and saying, let's understand a bit more about where you're coming from here. Well, it's because I'm rubbish at it and everybody else is better than me and I feel embarrassed. Well, then you address that. And if it's something else, then you can uh, you can address that. So good people, very important to have good parents around about you. And and, um, and obviously, as we said, we already said, a good coach or a good teacher, uh, to, to have that who's who, who understands that that responsibility that their job is to build good habits, but you know the, these can be transferable. These are these are great habits that can tra- transfer into anything they want to do. And, and I've just written that down because I wanted to make sure I got to that. I say to kids all the time about music and languages because they tend to be the subjects when it gets to subject choice time. They they tend to be the ones that kids discard very very quickly. Yeah. And I, I say to them, if you can play a musical instrument and if you can learn a language, you can learn anything. You can do anything because of how it makes the brain work and how malleable you have to be and the dedication you give. And although, and, and then the comeback is, but I'm never going to France and I don't need to do that. Actually, the language isn't what's important. It's the learning that's important. But as you said, kids Absolutely. don't know that yet. Us trying yeah. to sell learning can be quite a difficult thing because it doesn't have that instant outcome rather than a or a test or an exam but even that can feel like it's quite far in advance getting the learning bit and motivation uh, resilience dedication uh, self-discovery problem solving all of those bits that come from learning the violin might help you become a sports coach or an accountant or a social worker or or any of those jobs how often do you talk to people about and and you must do a lot so this might get us into this next bit i'm always amazed the number of sports people who are now working in business and advising businesses what is it sport is able to teach business the the number i think we have to be a little bit careful with sport because i i would look at an awful lot of coaching i've seen in sport and say that's not a good example of what good good coaching is because it is, there's still too much of do five of these and three of these, and if if this happens, do this, and if that happens, don't don't do that. But what I think sport does is you you live your life in sport is always looking for tiny areas to try and improve and be better. Whereas that what business does can do is because they're so busy doing stuff they already know how to do. So sometimes they bring in people with a skill set rather than grow that skill set from within. So everything I do is to help organizations to develop an environment which is much more about the growth of the individual. It's really interesting that, that the motivators for younger generations now moving into the workplace, particularly coming out of America, has moved away from career progression and salary to, to individual growth. That's what people are looking for. The number one thing they're looking for in their boss is a good coach because they want to grow and, and learn and move forward. Now, there is a lot of a disconnect because young people want to move too fast. They want the big salary and the nice car without doing the hard yards. So that there's a, they have to be careful with the, their aspiration. But but this is the way the world is changing for, for the older generation and, and an older manager managing a young younger individual. They have to be aware of these things that are, that are, are going on there. So but the, the number one thing I think business really should look at is this idea of continually trying to be a little bit better now than you were a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. That That's key. And too much of development of business is an annual appraisal where you sit down once a year to talk about how you've done. And it's usually based on some kind of outcome. Did you hit your target this year? Oh, no, yeah. What was it? What was your development area you had in your, your appraisal? I can't remember what that was. Okay, well, we'll stick something in for next year. And then, so listen, well done. You've, you've hit your target, but we're going to increase that by 10% next year. So if you go and do that again, and, and rather, rather than talking about, well, what skills would I need to do to then have a 10% higher target? So people end up just working, getting up earlier and working later. So it, it's it's the one thing we, we need to, I think sports people are in the habit of doing that, is looking at themselves, what are the skills I need to be successful here? How can I continue to work on those on a regular basis to allow myself to look back over a year and say, yeah, I'm better now than I was 12 months ago. And I feel it doesn't happen enough in, in, in whole, whole aspects of life. You yeah. know, if you're a parent, if you, can you look back, look back today and look back and say, "Am I a better parent now than I was 12 months ago?" And if and if if you everyone hopes will say, well, "Hopefully, I am." Well, what are the specific areas? And the way I live my life is I look at the specific areas. 
So I want to be better at this element. So I work on it. I add it in. I look for opportunities. I'll, I'll try and get better. I'll, I'll get some feedback. And then I keep looking back thinking, yeah, I, I do genuinely feel that I moved myself forward in these specific areas over the last week, month, 12 months. And that, I think that's a great way to live your life. That's what we're designed as human beings. I think we know we like new stimuli. We like to move forward. We like to grow. That's important. That's why we've got to where we are in the, in, in the world. So so applying that so i think it is what that's the number one thing i would say i, I would I'm, I'm not bringing a whole host of stuff from sport because i've seen a, an awful lot of stuff that's not done very well and i'm also we, you don't have the time in business you know you've got stuff you need to get done we don't have 24 7 to work out how we can do things a little bit better so we need to do little little and often is the key but be very focused on on, on key, key areas so th th there is a transfer but that that to me well i've looked at as a number one thing you know build development is, is part of your day job not as something you do on a, a kind of monthly or annual basis uh, the the continual development that the annual review is something that's frustrated me for years and there should be little markers to to try and address those some of them can be daily and some of them can be weekly I, i've seen kids kids are so smart in certain areas and you can see them sometimes rolling their eyes and going he's been on a course <laughs> or you know they they know exactly what you've just done at inset because every teacher is doing that thing on Tuesday morning having just learned it yeah. on Monday afternoon how do you keep away from fads and and things that are just off the shelf right we've seen them do that so we'll we'll do that yeah, I think there's, um, you mentioned growth mindset before, for people who are aware of that, a lady called Carol Dweck, her work, that, that whole thing has, has fascinated me because it's a piece of work which has been around since the 70s. There's some brilliant, brilliant, you know, research in there and some real principles that are easy to, to um, sell to people because they make a lot of sense about this idea of, of don't, don't, you know, um, well, before I go into that, well, I ask people, say, well, have you read, you know, I've heard about card work, I know about growth mindset, so what, 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 what is mindset? What does that mean? What, and, how, and how research, what does it mean? And people don't know because they've not taken enough time to understand. Mindset is really your belief about where ability comes from and whether it's actually something that you can learn and grow and is malleable or whether it's, or it's fixed and you can't change it very much. So unfortunately, what happens with the fads is people take it. They don't go into enough detail to really understand how to apply it. And they bang it out there as a few series of buzzwords. And then suddenly we lose some really good things because of, of, of um, the, this terminology that goes with it. And I can see why people are selling terminology because it becomes theirs. And, and people then go and buy books and buy products, etc. Let's if, we, if we're serious about helping people to learn... Don't use the buzzwords. Just take the concepts. And the concepts of my, the best ones of mindset are behaviours. And there's five behaviours which are key. We've got to work hard in areas, but not just any area, but ones that make a big difference. You've got to challenge yourselves and not do the easy stuff, but do the hard stuff so we can learn from it. Setbacks will happen, so things will go wrong. Let's commit some time and effort to learn from that and not use that as a way just to define our ability. Let's actively look for feedback and make sure the environment's rich in the right kind of feedback and let people take responsibility for their own learning. So... To me, um, and this is just a, a, an idea, but you know, those are elements which are part of any lesson you deliver in any school, whether that's maths or English or music. So that should be not just the content we're going to deliver. Here's how we're going to play this, or here's how we're going to do adding up or taking away today. But we're going to focus on challenge. So we're going to challenge people in different different areas. So we, if we if we take the basics, then we can avoid using the the, the fads and the buzzwords and just to build it on a solid foundation. And I would say to anyone who goes on a course like that, take longer to really understand what are some of the real foundation principles that either reinforce what you do or add to it, but add it into your natural style and don't just suddenly come up with a new thing because people can see through that, particularly if you don't. Well, you started something a, a few months ago, Mr. H, and why are we not doing that anymore? You think, oh, uh, because we've been told to do something else now. So, uh, yeah. so we have to be, be careful with the buzzwords and the, the, that, that sort of stuff, but do take time to reflect and think about it and, and add it into sl slow little changes to what you're doing. So it just feels like a gradual process of you developing your craft rather than kind of jumping from one thing to the next. Because as you say, young, young kids are not as emotionally developed as we adults, but they're smart. They, know, <laughs> they can see through something which is a bit phony straight away. There's, there's two things that worry me about growth mindset, especially in schools. If I see a growth mindset poster, I'm already suspicious. And if somebody tells me they're doing a growth mindset lesson, 
it always worries me. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I was my sister in law was she sent me a message. Oh, this would be a couple of years ago now. Or uh, my nephew had come home from school, and they'd had uh, an assembly, and. My my sister in law Claire thought I would get a big kick out of this, and she she was right because they'd had this whole assembly on Brazilians, and I was like Brazilians, and yeah, a whole assembly on Brazilians, and she'd asked them what what was the assembly about? He said, well, you know when when you get something wrong, but you keep trying, and even though something's difficult, you keep going. So he'd heard Brazilians, <laughs> but it was a whole assembly on resilience, and. I, <laughs> I was just, I was in tears laughing. Oh, he'd, I, he'd, he'd got the concept, but he'd completely <laughs> got the buzzword wrong. And I just thought that was just magic. The Brazilians are very good at keeping going, Mum. I thought you were going, going to tell me they had a beauty therapist who came in to, to show some of our work. <laughs> no, no, not quite as exciting as that. Okay. Did, did you ever watch the Michael Jordan um, series? During the first lockdown, that everybody watched. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. No, no. It, it is on. It is on my list. I know it's been out for a while, but um, you know, I, I can. I'm a reader. If I'm honest, Bruce, I've I've read. You know, I <laughs> probably an unhealthy amount because I, I like that. Just be able to sit and reflect. So I, I do like some of these things, but I've, I've certainly not run out of things to watch. But uh, I've heard it's very good, and I, and I do like that kind of thing. As loads you can pick up. There's there's one bit in, in particular that that really hits home, and you mentioned about your son. Although he's involved in a, in a high level of sport, he still liked the social play because they still love it. And I always, you know, when you see professional footballers, they get to do football a lot, or prof any professional athlete would they do it if they weren't getting paid for it? Yeah. I, I always wonder. And Michael Jordan, when he's shooting Space Jam, part of his condition is that they build him a facility because he's trying to get his basketball game back. And he runs these pickup games, but it's like the All Star Weekend. Mm. Everybody goes to play Michael, and it's pure, it's selfish for him. It's his development, it's him wanting to improve. And then he says on it that I'm watching him and he's got that. So I know I can attack that in the regular season and he's doing this and that's a strength. So I'll have to combat that. But he just loved it. But he was really driven by competition. He wanted to be the best. But not everybody can be Michael Jordan and Ian Milne, who you'll know the bear, mm. um, he keeps talking about how we need more rubbish rugby players because we need third teams and fourth teams and how much do you think we're able to do for participation and then that'll help the late developer or that'll help the person that maybe stumbles into it from another sport? How hard do you think we're having to work for that in this country? Yeah, and I think th those people are the ones that are, are kind of, we're, we're missing those ones who are dropping out too early now because there's some other things to do. So in the past, you might have stayed because, well, what else am I going to do if I don't come along to rugby training or football training or hockey training? Well, now well, I can sit at home and I can watch, you know, any number of things on, on, on TV. I, I still always come back and I, I do get that, but I still think if people can, we, we don't like, to, there's not much that we probably do that we're, I'm totally rubbish at this. You, you have some element, do we like that? We, we, we like to add value to groups and teams. That's part of our human nature. We evolved into societies for a good reason. So we became part of groups because it was safer ultimately in being part of a team. But we had to add value there. Otherwise, you found you were out of that group when you're on your own and survival was much harder. So even if you're in a team, so you still got to add value because people will want to do well. So I still think we need to encourage people to go at their own pace, see the signs of success and, and not and tell the stories about the superstars who, don't, who, who end up, you know, running out of steam because people catch them up because either they've just had some advantage, which might be physical or it might just be more time on task. So we need those, those people. So inspire them, a bit, but we still, we still need to come back to really rubbish then, then, um, and they're not improving. Are they really likely to keep going with something or find something else when there's loads, loads of other things to do? So still have that spirit. If you've only got one hour session a week with your team and you're playing at a recreational level, try and make sure you're, you're, you're sharp enough to, to make that a useful one hour or, or encourage people to do things on their own. I, I still remember my first rugby tour to, trip to New Zealand. Uh, and this was, a, this was before professionalism. So we were allowed out and about a bit more and you, you met and you went to your pubs and you spoke to locals and, and it, was, it was awesome. You know, and all the, the club rugby at that point in New Zealand was all 
you know, we, so what, do you, what do you do at training? And, uh, and we said, oh, we always do fitness on a Tuesday night and it's a bit of sprints on a Thursday night. And they said, well, we don't do any of that. They say, listen, that's our responsibility. Do it in our own time. Go for a run, you know, whatever you want to do. So we spend our time on the technical stuff and the skill stuff. And, and um, it really resonated with me because I thought, well, you know, we're, we're doing all this stuff. And I think, yeah, I should be doing this on my own. It's, it doesn't, I go run after work. It's easy to do. So we need to think in that way. This and let's make the very best use of the, the time that we've got. So people actually have a bit of fun. And this is maybe where unstructured games come into, um, you know, more of that, that kind of participation level and club level, third and fourth, 15 level that we, but again, these are everything I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious. I'm, this is not easy to do. So if we don't put a huge amount of thought into what we're going to deliver there, and we just turn up and it's well, it's a second Tuesday in October. So we always do this on the second Tuesday in October, and uh, we always do ten laps of the pitch to warm up. You're going to get people are going to lose motivation, and there's there's too many other options now of, of stuff they can do. That they can go to the gym. You know, it's inside. It's dry. It's air conditioned. You know, you get a wee coffee afterwards and stuff. So, so we need to be. Uh, we need to. Do, we ultimately, we can't. We've got to be good, haven't we? We're in a small country with a small population. You know, if we want these things and these outcomes, we've got to think about what we're doing and 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 let's be as good as we can in those areas. And you, you've literally written the book on this. Um, so you you wrote the book on on Red Dot Parenting, which which I read and and I've encouraged other people to read and. I uh, let people borrow my copy, which you're going to give me a row for, because they should really be buying their own one. But um, how how often do your kids roll their eyes and go, "Oh no, he's coaching us again"? <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate the plug. It, it was a real passion of mine um, when I, the work I do with sports, and I still work with sports now. If you said to me if I wanted to kind of had an hour with someone and I wanted to try and influence, you know, the, the, the young person the most. Would I speak to that young person as a group? Would I speak to their coaches? I would speak to parents. I'd speak to the parents every time. They are the most motivated group who want to help, but they're the least well informed through their interactions with the sport about what to do for the best. It's not just kind of pay for this and um, and pick them up, drop them off then and pick them up there. So again, it's it's part of parenting. So the red dot parenting is really about helping parents understand their role, the things they can do, the stuff they're doing well already, but also some ideas of things they could they could try that that will make a difference based on all the challenges that we've uh, that we've talked about. So so that was a real a real passion. Um, it, everything, all the content in there, and I had a look through it the other day actually. Um, I live all that stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess it's it's who I am. I my kids probably wouldn't say it's coaching anymore. I just think it's interactions with uh, with dad, and I use a number of different things. Sometimes just I, I do things, and they they mimic my. They just copy what you do. It's amazing that sort of stuff when you're in a close proximity with people. But they know that um, the the a strong message from me and and, and my wife is the same. It's their responsibility. We don't want to take that away from learning. We're here to help and support you, but but come and talk to us. And we've got a good relationship and an open relationship with with them in terms of they'll come and, and talk to us about stuff. But uh, I probably feel like I am. Um, it doesn't feel like coaching. And in, in the work I do in business, the end game really for is that you don't whatever you decide to call it. Basically, these are interactions with other human beings, and, and part of I take my role very seriously of helping other people to reach their potential. And if I recognise something. And although it might be a bit of a tricky conversation to have, then I'm going to have that conversation, not because I want to, to highlight that I've done something wrong, um, but because I think maybe, maybe this can help you to see things in a different way or do things in a different way. So it just I never think of it as coaching ultimately, although I use the word, it's just really supporting somebody else's learning. And that's uh, if that's important to you in life, then you, you'll look and see the opportunities. And then the key thing is take as many as you can because you'll look back when, when your time is up and say, did you know, did I did I genuinely help and support others? Will they remember that? Will that level and other people? Fantastic. Then, however long you you last, you you've done, you've made a good fist of it. I would say. I remember being at a, a business networking event and you were there speaking, and you had a room full of some pretty high flying Edinburgh business people, absolutely in the palm of your hand, and you were asking them about how important coaching was, and then how much attention did you put onto it. And there was a huge difference. Everybody thought it was important, but they weren't necessarily giving it tight. You used the phrase time on task. So they weren't necessarily improving their coaching uh, abilities and capabilities. Are you looking for the ripple effect? You help people who you know are then going to go and help other people. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, 
we need to understand what good coaching looks like and be quite be sort of very simple. And some of the stuff we've talked about are the, the building blocks of good coaching. Then if you if you start delivering that, then I see so I see my my older my older two Rosie's twenty two, George's twenty, Jack's fifteen. I can see Rosie and George stuff that we've talked about talking to the younger brother in 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 that way which is great so that's the, the learning the seeing, seeing things done that way this is the environment we create you know what it's like in a, in a big environment like a school if we operate in a certain way people copy that and mimic it this is how we do things around here ultimately so it's really important asking loads of questions giving people responsibility their job to come up with the solutions make them feel part of it make them feel valued trust them to take on new tasks so all these things all these emotions are so important to drive a lot of the behavior so how do you, um, it's a, again, another crucial learning. People remember much more than the detail. They remember how you make them feel. So remember that. How, how do I want these people to feel? How do you want the kids to feel when they walk out the door from the class? B bored out their skull of the, of the same information or inspired because they've, they've actually moved, feel like they moved themselves forward. So, so use that. And we, this is where we started, didn't we? People remember 30 plus years ago how it felt to be part of an, an environment where a team that was an underdog Felt, felt like that, that had a, an outside chance, but it was a one in 10 chance maybe of beating a very good England team. And we were all emotionally invested in that. And then what you learn from that ultimately is by changing the tactics, by working hard, by by using the, the, the energy of the crowd, we were able to overcome that. And, and people remember, I can still feel, I'm, as I'm talking about, I can feel that little tingle down the back yeah. of the neck. That's, that's, that's years ago. Me um, too. And that's what, that's what we connect to. So, the power of relationships in this world, but those those emotions that we can connect to with with individuals are are, are crucial. So I think it's a a key part of how I hope to try and live my life. But it's not the job's not done yet. You know this is um this is where I want to keep aspiring to be better and improving. Uh, I remember observing a teacher who, as I arrived at class before the kids arrived, she said to me, "Oh, I can't believe you've come to watch this. This is the most boring lesson of the year." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I nearly yeah. cried. I nearly. I'm sure she didn't I, I, disappoint either. Yeah. No, she didn't. I tell you what. It, I know she. I think it might have been the most boring lesson of the decade. Um, I, I won't name that person because I'd get shot. I think. Um, right. I, we're getting there, Tori, and you've given me a huge amount of time, but I love it. And as you know, I I could go on forever. I, I would. There's two. There's two things to this one question I'd like to answer. Who would you love to go and learn from? So which person or which business, which environment, which team would you like to go to and immerse yourself in for a week to learn if you could only choose one? And then the other one would be who would you love to go and support and work with to try and improve? So is there a is there a coach or a player or an individual or your next door neighbor that you think actually you could do a week worth of Tony Stanger? So who would you learn from and who would you go and help? Ooh, um, interesting. The, the way the way I've, I've approached rather than so the first thing John to Mary was I'd love to go to American football. Having seen it, I'd love to go and look inside there in terms of what goes on, particularly in terms of how they're selecting these athletes. You know that these these the draft, for example, these are million dollar contracts, young people. So the combine, they look at these players and what goes on, how they're assessing them. So I'd love to go and just find out a little bit more um, that's going on in there. So I couldn't necessarily give you a, a, a team, um, you know, but but it would be um, it'd be fascinating to have a look at that because because it's, it's a sport that I'm, I'm really interested in, as I said before, but I don't know enough about other sports I've become in, come involved in. So. I, one fine way, which is which is really good about the, the the modern technological age you're working, is you can learn thinking from loads of people by looking at a video, and it might be a TED talk or a book and stuff. So you can, you can. So I, I love doing that. But what I'd say to anyone who's who's doing that is, what are you doing with that information? Because people say to me about a book they've read, and so that what did you what did you um? So what are you doing differently now because of that? And it's like, what do you mean? You know, and some things you can read just because it's enjoyment, absolutely. But have you taken little elements and little nuggets from that? So I've actually what I've, I what I do is I, I write down some of the key things and I go over those consistently. The, the little sort of little things which I think are important. Like for example, as I said before, people remember how you make them feel. So I've I've absorbed that through different reading and, and that, then I apply that regularly. That's a key part of how I deliver now because of something I've learned. So I'd go and have a look at American football. Um, I still do think there's a there's a there's a real there's a lots of brilliant people who work in different businesses who haven't got time to really think about well how could I do this better if I wanted to really get more out of the people around about us and move away from the annual appraisal system 
how on earth would I do that? I haven't got time to think through that. So I'd like to get a group of, of kind of, you know, good leaders in a, in a room who who's, have a core responsibility for that and a number of different businesses so we can share ideas and then just kind of share some thoughts and then see what works in their their uh, environment. So ultimately, I do do that kind of anyway, but I, that's the stuff I love doing because if you can help someone to think through a quite complicated area and give them some clarity, but also say, and here's what you need to do to apply this. And you know what? It's not that difficult if you're committed to it then the feel good you get from doing that is, is amazing. So um, as much as I love sport and I will continue to work in sport, there's a, there's some brilliant people who, you know, their passion might be accountancy or, or something like, like that, which is, which is different from sport. So I'd love to, to share some of the things that I've learned, which will, will really help them. Yeah, the, your point on the talks and what you've learned, I'm, I'm worried for kids and teams when we get out of this situation and go back to training, because there's people who have watched every single video and read books and been on webinars. And when kids come back, they're going to be juggling with razor blades and they're going to be doing it because they've seen somebody come up with this idea. So it's going to be interesting to see how coaches and, and teachers have learned, like you're saying, from the experiences yeah. they've had in the last year, where there has Absolutely. been a chance to learn, and but it's learning totally. a different way. I'll be yeah. interested to see if it makes people better. Tony, thank you. Uh, I have absolutely loved it. Uh, I could Me go too. on and on, but I, I'm asking people at the end of the pods to finish a sentence for me. Um, and I'm I'm really interested to know how you're going to finish this. So for Tony Stanger, happiness is... Um, um, it's, it's, it sounds, it sounds like we've set this up. No, happiness is learning something new. I, I, I do. I've, I've had jobs in the past, which I've, I've, I, when I've moved on, I've looked back and thought, what, what is the, what is the real reason uh, why? And I was probably a bit bored because I wasn't stimulated enough. So really, happiness is why my own Stanger Pro as a business is seven years old, and it's, it's been, you know, every day is a school day. Ultimately, I love that idea of taking a good book, talking to someone. I just love that and, and seeing if I could use that so that I feel like as a human being I'm going going forward and not 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 backwards. So yeah, it sounds sounds <laughs> it sounds a kind of stage dancer, but no, just learning something new. I, lo I love that. That's when I'm. I think I'm at, my wife would say I'm at my best when I'm I'm in, really involved in something, learning something new, which is kind of allows me to move forward. So um, yeah, that, that would be it. Yeah, I reckon it's time that we had Tony Stanger in Parliament or the UN <laughs> or something. I think there's there's lots people could learn. Tony, thank you very much for giving up your time. I've absolutely loved it. Me too. Thank you, Bruce. Much appreciated. Thank you. Take care. Oh, you're all on your own now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Well, uh, a hero of mine, um, and I'm just delighted that he's able to take time and, and speak, and there's something in there for everybody, whether you're a teacher, a parent, an athlete, a business person, uh, right from the horse's mouth, what an absolute superstar, and very, very humble, but very determined, and absolutely with a growth mindset. I have loved it, and I have learnt by listening. Uh, my name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast. Please download on Apple, Spotify, or Acast. We're also on YouTube and Facebook, where you can see us in action as well. If you've enjoyed it, please leave us a review so other people can find us, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. My name is Bruce Aitchison, and my happiness is egg-shaped.